All right, welcome to another No Spiro podcast interview. It's three days after our last one, so Jeepers is back to back releases. I hope you are going to enjoy today's episode. It's Seriola Leilandi. It is the Yellowtail Kingfish down here in the south. That is their name. Uh, up in California, Baja area, they are Seriola dorsalis, very close relative. We call them the Yellowtail Kingfish in New Zealand and Australia, more commonly called a kingy. Today, we're going to geek out on that. So, welcome to the No Spiro podcast. If you're brand new here, my name is Shrek. I get to interview spearfishing legends from all over the planet. Today, it's a couple from Sydney. It's Craig Sea Dog and Simon Tripp. And as mentioned, we're going to geek out a little bit on the yellowtail kingfish, including hunting strategies and how to find them. So, yellowtail kingies are active predatory carnivores, feed mostly on small fish, squid, and crustaceans. And uh, apparently, the maximum recorded weight of one of these fish is uh, 96.8 kg, which is over 200 pounds. Um, the world record uh, caught in New Zealand was, was I believe, 54 kilograms. Uh, it's a, around that weight, and it could be 52. It was held, held by Nat Davey, and the women's world record is also around that 50 kilo mark. Uh, funnily enough, caught by Nat's wife, Rochelle, and uh, those two are a pair of legends down there in New Zealand. And anyway, these are a special fish. In our spearfishing world, um, they're often a, a, a really a, a big first pelagic species for temperate water species, uh, temperate water sparrows in New Zealand and sort of the southern half of Australia, if you like. And uh, I know in California, it's a big deal um, shooting a yellowtail. So Today we're going to geek out on them. We're going to talk hunting strategies and a whole bunch of other stuff. And we're going. It's all in honor, I guess, of this competition which is coming up. It's the Adreno Kingfish Cup, which happens over a weekend in November in the Greater Sydney area. We're going to get into it, and the details will come out and be sprinkled through today's episode. Again, if you want to go to the show notes, it's noobspirit.com forward slash kingfish. And all those details will be up in there from today's interview. I hope you uh, really enjoy it. A, a quick shout out to the patrons powering the podcast. This week I want to pay homage to the guys that are on the the dive knife tier. It's, uh, so Reese, Greg, Alex, Jesse, Justin, Matt, Jesse as well. There's a bunch of other legends. Ben, guys, legends, thank you so much for putting fuel in the Noob Spirit outboard. It means a a massive amount. And um, if you are a past, present, or or a future patron of the show, I really appreciate it. It helps keep this sucker moving. All right, guys, let's get into geeking out on Sirioli Leilandi, the yellowtail kingfish, or kingy, as we like to call them. Here we go with Simon and Craig. Adreno stocks equipment for noobers. The gear you need for all things freediving and spearfishing. The Adreno spearfishing team froth on helping customers learn about the latest in spearfishing equipment, local diving, upcoming trips and events for Spiros of all levels of experience. There's no ego in there. You're going to meet cool people that love this spearing lifestyle as much as you do. Visit them in store in one of their huge mega stores around Australia. Chat to one of their friendly team members. Take advantage of the Noob Spiro discount code. Save $20 on every purchase over $200 in store, online, easy savings. Pump in the code Noob Spiro if you're shopping online or in store, mention it to one of their friendly team members and save 20 bucks over 200. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro in store. Shop with Adreno, our partner for more than 200 episodes. Buying gear online can be tricky. You ask yourself the same questions. Will it arrive on time? Is it actually what I want? How much is the shipping going to cost? Great news, the name you can trust is Neptonics. Neptonics have route package protection. Basically, insurance on your gear so you can have peace of mind. Free shipping to the lower 48 when you spend $199 or more. Clear, transparent communication on shipping time and most gear ships in two days. They also have my favorite, a no BS returns policy. That's right, no BS. And it's all backed by one of the strongest names in spearfishing. And it finishes with tonics. And it's not gin and tonic, it's Neptonics. Solid gear that works. Visit Neptonics, buy tough gear. Use the code Noob10 to save 10%. That's right, use the code Noob10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at Neptonics.com. Mm-hmm. 
G'day legends, welcome back to the Noob Sparrow Podcast. I'm joined by two absolute legends. It's Simon Tripp, the, uh, a, a long-time friend of the show. Simon was here in, I think, our first episode, Simon. And uh, he's come back a couple of times. We've chatted about various issues. He's now the current serving president of the USFA. He's still uh, um, a really uh, well-regarded Sparrow in our world and in our spearfishing culture. Um, he's a spearfishing instructor if you want to visit that. Uh, Simon, what's your website again? spearfishingacademy.com.au spearfishingacademy.com.au Simon is an absolute legend he 100% gets the whole vibe of spearfishing and he leads from the front uh, with positivity and fantastic uh, and he's been doing this for a long time he's sustained the froth which tells me that he he's got the right motivations behind his spearing and I'm also joined by Craig who's the manager of the Sydney Adreno store another fellow frother I just learned a little bit more of his background before we jumped on here um, Craig grew up in uh, PNG for part of his life and even served in the Merchant Navy I believe was that right did I have that right Craig yeah, merchant up in New Guinea and Australian Navy down here. Oh, crazy, mate. So you're a waterman through and through. That's the sea dog, the regretful sea dog name I created on Facebook, yeah. Craig Sea Dog. No one knows your real name anymore. It's Craig Brugman, isn't it? It's, it usually, yeah, 100%. It usually sort of moves to sea bog or something along those lines <laughs> in the shop, <laughs> in the store. Answer to anything. <laughs> yeah. Craig, I, lo- I love people that are um, a little bit sort of – you know, they seem a little bit eccentric. Uh, um, I like the vibe of the Sydney store. When I was down there doing some live interviews, um, I don't know if the vibe was as high. We did, I, we got like thirty or forty people in the shop for the for a couple of live interviews I did. But recently, you've, you've run a massive event there in the Adreno Sydney store. You had Alexi uh, Molshinov there uh, with Adam, and you guys filled the bloody shop up to the brim. I, I heard it has been an exciting quarter. We had Alexi Molshinov. You know, this time sort of last week and this time next month we're likely to have William Truebridge, another freediving cool. legend. What date is um, that and where can people find out about it? That'll be posted on our Adreno Sydney social pages and Adreno will post it on their official pages. Okay, cool. Yeah. Jeez, so you guys are- So we've had some good ones. We had um, we had some breath nights with Dan Parsons. We've had uh, a tuna hunting night, had a hunt tuna with Simon Tripp and Andrew Harvey. Again, the partners in... Australian Spearfishing Academy. Is that Jaws? And, um, is that his name? Yeah, cool. Yeah, Jaws. 100%. Yeah, it was Jaws. And um, yeah. um, Emmanuel Bova, mate. Manny Sub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was on that. He was great. Yeah. And the two were completely different <clears throat> in yeah, their yeah. gear. Um, and they agreed on everything. Like they just had their own style. It was fascinating that night. It was a really good talk. Yeah, they, cool. isn't it? Yeah. It's been good, mate. It's a Shrek, we, you know, I started at the Toronto Sydney about three years ago. I was in debt recovery. Believe it or not, for 25 years and went back into my childhood passion in spearfishing and um, and plan to sort of retire and die at Adreno now. But what <laughs> occurred <laughs> What occurred for me fairly quickly is um, a young Spiro comes up and he grabs a gun off the shelf with his granddad and walks out the door and then mum comes in the next day returning the gun and said, I'm not happy with this. So I'm two things I'm afraid of, guns and the ocean. There's no one to take him out. Um He's not old enough yet to go to a spearfishing sort of trainer. And I said to her, look, I'm going in the water tomorrow. Are you local? Are you, where are you living? And the kid was an Eastern Suburbs boy, so I'm at Bondi diving a lot. And that, that particular year I dived a hell of a lot and met him after school and I ended up being a bit of a child mining service for that fellow. And, and then it just continued on for there. What I wanted to do is make sure that when someone bought a spear gun, they're going to do the right thing in the water and, obey and abide by our fisheries regulations, which are important to all of us for our future. Mm-hmm. And I'm, um, I've am i come of age now, so I'm more of a selective spearo. Started cup of tea spearing in PNG, as, as you know, and I'm very selective now about what I take out of the ocean. So um, really nice to take a kid in the water with a gun, put them on a target, get them to take a couple of shots and get them to know their spear gun. I chase fish around the water in New Guinea for years without really getting to know you know, the ability of the gun and the range and, and capabilities. And we free shafted, we didn't use lines on our guns, just used like old fashioned traditional muskets, you know, homemade guns. Um, and it wasn't until I got down here and learned from, you know, some of the old timers and the Australian divers and Sydney divers, like Ian Puck, which is a crossroad for me, and there's some great divers in Bondi and started working at Dreno. I started getting better at myself. And one day Bob McComb came along, the 
president before Simon for the USFA, and uh, he said, how do we get these 20 to 30-year-old Spiros in the water? Uh, we just had a competition, and there was no one representing that age group. And when I die and Simon Tripp takes over and Simon Tripp moves on, we've got a gap of 10 years, you know. We've, then we've got some young fellas who are great comp divers, but we, we talked and I thought it was mine and Bob's idea. We were completely wrong. I thought, well, let's talk about it. You know, like I'm out chasing kingfish every weekend and snapper and it's a, we, could, we could say to, you know, the community it's a, a selective type of um, tournament, um, try and include as many people as can in pos- as possible young kids, uh, right up to adults, male, female, doesn't matter, and um, get them to jump in the water and look for a kingfish. As you know, Shrek, it's, there's techniques and we can share them with, mm. we have an info night to share some techniques on how to hunt kingfish and people like Simon Tripp and some of the top Spiros in the country will come in and talk about how to do that. And then there's a, a weekend of the hunt. Um, and, you know, for me, I jumped in the water Last time last year to go, I'm going to have a crack at this. It's I'm normally helping run the event. I thought I'm going to really have a good crack at this. I'm going to try and get a fish. I'm going to try and weigh in, you know. And I pushed off the rocks of North Bondi, and I saw a kid petrified with little boogie board fins in front of me. And I'm like, "Are you okay, buddy?" And he's like, "Yeah, my mates are out there. I'm fucking shitting myself." <laughs> and I went, do you, "Do you want me to be your buddy?" And you know, I don't like diving alone anyway. And I said to him, "Do you want me to be your buddy?" And he goes, "That'd be." Great. And I said, You're comfortable swimming out with me to your mates? And we swam out to the rock line where his mates were, and they were doing drops in about, you know, 10 to 12 meters of water. And one of them had a weight belt on him that was about eight kilos, like a scuba belt with boogie board fins and great surface so he could equalize. And he was trying to get back up from like 10 meters. And I thought, Oh, I'm not going to leave these kids and sort of in case I have to pull them back up again. And yeah. he shot a goatee. Oh, beautiful. High-fiving at the top of the water. I'm like, fuck, that is awesome. It's, <laughs> it, felt like, it felt like my first fish. Yeah, and yeah, he goes, 100%. All I want to do is, <laughs> and he goes, all I want to do is get out of the water and I, wanna, I just want to cook it for mum. And I'm like, mate, I felt like I won the Kingfish Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we got out of the water and my day was done, you know. But um, it's a really, really cool thing. In fact, Simon Tripp created the idea of uh, and a Kingfish type of tournament all-inclusive tournament uh, many, many years back um, in the USFA records. So it's really, really cool. It's transitioned to now, um, what do we have, Simon? We have up to 200 divers entering this. Yeah, we had just over 200 last year. So um, oh, that's sick. It. So I think 210 last year. It's a really it's a really unique concept, isn't it? Like yeah, it's really, you know, round one iconic and arguably um, very available species in the greater Sydney area, particularly around that sort of season. And um, what an exciting way. Like a lot of people are intimidated by the idea of comps because it's like, oh, I've got to shoot, go out and shoot multiple species and these people do this stuff week in, week out. And But if it's just one species and I can go out and I can just dive whenever I have availability, it's kind of like a pretty cool comp. It's so out to be so prestigious. I probably should let time and sort of take over and talk, but I think it's um, the most prestigious event in the country. It's uh, not everyone can get a kingfish. You know, I've seen stats like 200 people enter the water on a Sunday and they weigh in eight to ten fish. Yeah. And Simon does the ratios and the stats and it's like 50 hours in the water on average for a diver to to get a kingfish. Wow. And out of those 200 divers, a lot of us each weekend would be nailing fish in our own backyard. So it gives – it gives the area a rest and we're chasing sort of pelagic species. Mm. And we're not taking anything out of, else, anything else out of the water. So it's pretty exciting. But Simon, you created the idea, mate. What what was what was the concept there? Like USFA has been going, we just had the 75th birthday for the USFA. It's- mate, it was um it was probably a, a heap of us that came up with it, mate, over a few beers. So uh I wrote it down and said, here we go. I don't know, 10, 10 years ago or more ago. And uh, someone pointed it out to me that said, mate, you, this concept was, is years old, but it's taken someone, and I'll give Adreno credit, just we could have started it and it would have just been a run-of-the-mill event. But um, it's um, with your help and, and sponsorship um, and through the store, it's just reached out to a lot more people. You know, mm-hmm. I think if it had stayed in the association, we might have had 50 people fish it, but... We've just yep. reached out to a much broader community over the years. And it's its fifth year now, Craig. So, and yeah. it's maintaining the bubble, the the froth, the, the spark. Everyone's still keen. People are looking forward to it. I've had umpteen messages already. 
So, look, if the weather plays its um, plays out, I'm I'm hoping for another record number. We seem, barring poor weather, with the numbers keep increasing. I think we had a dud year where we only fished one day. Um, it wasn't as big a sign on, but still great. Yes. Um, I think it was 170 or 180. We're still at 170, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, look, it it goes on. It's a, it's a feel good <clears throat> event. Kingfish are the primary target fish now that jewfish have kind of moved on the sewerages have gone from sydney so they've gone back up the estuaries um and kingies are the target fish the dream fish for every spiro in sydney and you don't need a big gun for it you don't need a big spear gun um and what i found two years back that the the beginner the new guy in spear fishing is the guy most likely to come across mm. great fish because the kingies are up in the shallows they're chasing the garries and the puffer fish, the toads. Um, they're in the white water. And often I talk to newbies. I said, hey, I saw you on Facebook. You got that cracking big 18 kilo kingy. Well done. Were you in the water long? No, mate. Got it in the first five minutes. Or I got a blister on my foot. I was only in 20 minutes and was swimming back to get out and it swam right up to me. So yeah. they are in the shallows in that top, you know, eight metres of water, most of the big ones in Sydney, a lot of them. Yeah. And this time of year is prolific for them. You, met, you mentioned garfish and, and pufferfish. Like a, a lot of people would associate schools of kingies with yakka. What are, you're finding they're in there chasing all sorts of different bait type species. Yeah, mate, I, well, squid are a, a great yeah. bait for kingies, yeah? yeah, and so are pike. Um, so you get small pike up in the shallows in, in schools. You get your flute mouth, you get your garries, the puffers, and the little squid. We're all we'll all be up in the shallow water in that top part of the the depth, you know, that first five six meters. Mm -hmm. um, and they like a bit of bubble. They like the the white water. They'll they'll be in there. They're hunting. They're ambushing stuff. They're whacking stuff, and they'll come out. Sure, they're in deep. You know, great spiros, kingfish spiros like Justin Ewan, um, Artie Mensdorf, guys like that will shoot them in in deeper than ten meters, but not yeah. much deeper. Yeah, and they get them there. So they're an all-round fish. They're very accessible for spearfishermen in Sydney, and I think that's that's the allure. Returning to Craig's question, thus, are they starting to come in now? What's the sort of seasonality of uh, kingfish in the in the Greater Sydney area? Well, the, the train of thought's always been that sort of. We used to say last weekend in October, you know, 25, 30 years ago, when we were saying the bigger kingies would come into Sydney, like you know, we'd say like those new rumour Montague Island sized kingies that. 25 kilo plus ones would come in. We always thought late October, and I'm happy for people to disagree with that and have their own point of view. But it's it's time on time. They'll, they'll come in maybe late September. They disappear. They come in late October and hang around for two or three weeks, the big ones. Um, and then I don't know what happens to them. Um, but the kingies are just then normally quite consistent right through for several months after that. And then we'll get, you know, the big ones will appear here and there. I don't know why. And that's why I'm getting young uh, Julian and Bell in on the information night to talk about some of the kingies because they're doing um, satellite tracking with tag kingfish. Ah, I was going to ask you some questions about that, yeah. Yeah, am I jumping ahead? It's, no, um, no, no, no. Like uh, one thing like what one thing I've seen like is like some marine biologists seems – seem to debate whether it's a benthopelagic species or a pelagic species. And one, one of the things I think is in, in sort of debate is, is the range. And they, the localised populations seem to have a smaller range than maybe some might suspect. And um, I'm kind of curious about it too. I was wondering sort of what you had learned. Well, take this winter. You can't – last year was a write-off in Sydney. It was so bad with weather. Um, and we still got fish on that kingfish carp. The first day was lean, one fish, and then the second day, I think 11 got weighed in. Wow. Um, yeah, so the size was down, the average size and everything was down. Um, but still this, there were fish there. But um, like this winter, diving the spots that I dived on the eastern beaches, I could practically name the 6 to 20 rat kingies because I was seeing the same rat kingies day in, day out. Um, yeah. on one headland, go to the next hand, then there's another group of them, go to the next hand, there's another group of them. Same size of fish, same number of fish. It was uncanny. Um, you know, I can't prove that they're the same, exactly the same fish, but it was weird, and that's in the, the middle of winter. So they're there at 60, just bordering on legal size. 
Some were bigger than others. We had Benito all through winter. Some of the guys were spearing them every time they went out. Um, I can't explain that. Benito in, in middle of winter, freezing cold, sometimes it's a bit hard to believe, but mm. there they were. And it was cold. Mm. It was 16 degrees, mate. So yeah, right. Cold and that, winter. They're normally associated with sort of their 18 to 20-something range, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you'll even get them a bit warmer down here in Sydney. So the Kings... It's I'm really, I was talking to Aaron Puckridge and he put me on to Julien um, with Project Kingfish. So I haven't wanted to look too much and, and spoil it for myself. Yeah, not, yeah. You want to be curious when you're asking them the questions. Um, and Derek Cruz, who you know, he referred me on to those guys for a bit of research as well. Cool. And they're so excited to come on, on the Thursday night. So when it, when is that? Sorry, where it's is that? It's the second of November, so the first Thursday in November, and that's the information night. Okay, and that's at Adreno, and that's at Adreno Sydney from six o'clock. Okay. So last the last couple of years have been parties like one hundred and eighty spiros. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, oh, it's it's insane, Shrek. You should mate, you should come down. You'd love it. Um, I think I tried to come down for the last one, and I was just yeah, like, you did. That's right. Something yeah. held you up. That's right because yeah, yeah, we invited yeah. you down. Um, you could do a host of interviews with guys too, kill two birds with one stone. But the the room just froths. There's so many keen people. It, it, to me, it's the best part, better than the event itself. There's everyone getting together. Rico, the Piala King, cooks up great paella. Yeah, I love it. Um, lots of food, lots of wisdom in the in the room, lots of newbies who froth. It's sensational. And um, I'll, I'll go for about three hours, two, two and a half, three hours. It's great. Mm. So um, we normally like to blend a bit of science and information, you know, to promote yeah, what we're about, that sustainability side, the selective and sustainable, because there's a train of thought that kingfish are in trouble. Mm. Um, we keep hearing that. Um, and as I mentioned to you earlier, before we went live, I spoke to several marine biologist friends today that, that sent me links. And looking at the links, they're, they're different. Mm. One saying sustainable, other saying um what was the term I used? Something Abundant. like that. sustainable, mm. undefined, uh, <laughs> different maturity sizes and levels, mm. and these mm. are recent um, writings and in scientific websites. So I I did a quick bit of research, and one was one of the bits of research I did was on on the records, the current Australian records. One of the, like I know the New Zealand uh, couple that have got the men's and women's world records, but I in my research I was kind of dumbfounded when. Reportedly, I think ninety six point eight kilo is the largest um, Seriola Leilandi found, and I, I I don't know where that's come from, but several websites cite the same figure. And then, but the maximum reported age of a yellowtail kingfish was only twelve years old, which seems like a relatively young fish. Um, so they must have a fairly remarkable growth uh, sort of uh, pattern because. Well- there Apparently they grow over two metres, well over two metres. Well, look, I'll, I'll read this out to you. Mm. It's just this is off fishgov.au, another site. Uh, longevity and maximum size is 20-plus years and 1.9 okay. fork length, which is prob- which would be over two metres in mm. length, 20-plus years. And maturity, and it says here in brackets 50%, so five to ten years at maturity. And that's 800 to 1250 millimetres at fork length. Mm. So, and female and male have a different yeah, yeah. Males peak earlier than females. Um, but it, it's fascinating what you get. I reckon mm. that big one has come from South America. I'm just going to go out there and have a bet. I'm going to say it's not from your land, mate. I'm going to give it to a, a continent. That, well, they're starting to do aquaculture over there, like, and they're starting to seriously farm these things. And like they've tried it in New Zealand. It seems like they've tried it in South Australia and a couple of other different places. And one of the problems I think with farming them is the waste aspect, like doing damage to the sort of the benthos. But it, it is very interesting to kind of geek out and learn a little bit about one species. I would love to be a fly on the wall for this information night that you've got with these marine biologists. That sounds like a fantastic event. Can you just yeah, rehash the date, time and place again for me? Sure. So it's, uh, it's on Thursday the 2nd of November. Yeah. It's at Adreno, Sydney. Perfect. Which is in Alexandria. Yep. Uh, in a in a city, in a city, Sydney, really. And then um, it runs from six o'clock. Mm. So six till about nine o'clock. I love um, it. It'd be great. So bring an appetite. 
and a thirst and come on. I got out for a spare a week and a half ago. I had 30 metres viz. Oh. And I love a kingy, I've got to tell you. Like some some southeast Queensland sparrows are a bit snobby about them because um, they're, they're relatively abundant up here. And I, I, I ended up plugging two of them. One of them was about 13, 14 kilo. Gave me a heap of curry. I put a shit shot in it. Did no damage to it. And it just lit up, dragged me around for about five or six minutes. And uh, the bloke I was with, he had never shot one. Um, so the second one I shot was a, was an even worse shot and he had to put in a second shot and he saved the day. But he got to play like an eight or nine kilo kingy around and it's fun. Like can you describe to me, and maybe Craig you could chime in, when you're in uh, Sydney and you're in, you've got some clean water, can you describe to me the average experience of experiencing yellowtail kingfish for the first time. Craig, go for your life. For the first time? Yeah, what's it like when you first see kingies? Describe for me the whole experience if you can remember it. It goes back about 25 years for me, but the, <laughs> what I get to see a lot, a lot is the young fellas I take out and you'll burly on sunset for hours or you'll try and do additional things, maybe a lot of kilometres um, to to try and cover ground to come across a fish and – when you when they come across the fish, like I'll always say to them, if you hear me go woo woo through the snorkel, and they're probably only going to be within two to three meters away if we got eight meter fish, I'll get them to put a point and they'll dive on the fish, you know, and they can't do it. They I've I've gr- I've gone behind them when the fish come in, and I've grabbed them and I've yelled out dive and pushed them underwater. <laughs> um, they're just completely in awe, and yeah. They don't want to shoot the fish necessarily. After I've, after that happens, uh, like you get out of the water and they go, that was just the best experience I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. Even though they're a Spiro and they've shot a lot of fish or a few fish or a few reef fish, they, they all say that was fucking awesome. That was so cool. That was yeah. sick, you know. Um, I think seeing them is one thing. That's a cool experience. And then initially, and then what I went through is, um, you're trying to get a good one. Or get a feed, and then they went, then I'm like, okay, I want to be getting something that's always 100 centimeters plus with a big head on it, you know, yeah, um, and a bit of a trophy hunter. And then now I've gone back to uh, last time Simon was in the water boat diving. He's like, dive down, mate. I'll video you. And I dive down, and I got, I just turn you turn your back on them, you know. And they were circling, and I turn my back again. I wanted them to vortex around me and just spend yeah. a bit of time and hang out with them. And I had the gun sort of there, and I popped up, and Simon's like, "Don't you want a bloody kingfish, mate?" <laughs> you know. And and I was just enjoying the experience. You know, it's um, I've gone back to basics now. Just I just want to see a kingfish. I don't have to take it. I don't have to shoot it. I just want to see one, mate. A king a kingy vortex is a pretty special experience when you can get that school to wrap around you, and you're in yep. the middle of the water column, clean water. And you're surrounded wall to wall with um with these with these animals. They're so powerful. They're so Isn't sleek it? and streamlined. They're like, I don't know, it's next level. And their their eyes, their it curiosity, is. the whole the whole the whole bag and kit. It's hard to describe on an audio podcast how special that is. Even it, it like is from, even, when it even happens to you when you've done it fifty times, it's still special. Yeah, for me, I think possibly the part of it in me that it talks to is that. The mental part of diving, you know, the being in the present moment and you're in the water and you're in the present moment 100% of the time when I'm diving or hunting in the water. Mm. So, um, and then you have an experience like that and it just, it just, yeah, it just makes you focus so much on what's in front of you. Um, and everything just disappears, drops away. You get out of the water and it stays with you for a long time. What about a, what's your best kingy, Craig? Best kingy would have been over 30 kilo, but it, I shot it. I put a great shot on it. Yeah. And then I pushed then I pushed towards it and I thought, oh fuck. My shaft looks tiny. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just woke up. And then it just woke up and went bang off and I swam off to my float. And of course, you know, 15, 20 meter float line, by the time I got to my float, it, they just tear themselves off the big ones. Yeah. But um my best kingy is probably but I took a customer out again. Not I didn't shoot the fish myself. It was him. He came in and he's had an old free diver gun, a local Bondi guy, a Russian fella, and um, been diving for 30 years. And he said, mate, use timber guns. Should I get a timber gun? I'm like, yeah, get one. You've always used a pipe gun. 
come and use one of mine. He said, let's go diving tomorrow. So what we are went you out. diving with, Craig? You got, what time we go? I, I, from the old days of homemade guns, I still use a homemade gun, homemade okay. timber gun. All right, perfect. And um, I've just gotten some of the dolphins who are better at making guns than I am, um, like an engineer, architect guy, and a tradie, carpenter, put together a few guns ourselves. And each year we sort of get paid for three or four new guns, yeah. But I think off the shelf what I'd buy is probably a McComb gun. That's probably most similar yeah. to what I'd like, a timber yeah. gun. I like to support the people that support us. So, you know, an Aussie gun builder, local. Mm-hmm. Um, and then probably Hatch. Hatch and Mira. Yeah, Hatch, yeah. yeah Hatch, Hatch or yep. then go to a rife off the shelf, you know. I do like a bit more mass to my guns. Yeah, um, love, it. love it. Yeah, so. So you, this customer, he gets his hand on the timber spear gun. Fish was, he, he, you know, for him it was all about wanting to come and buy a gun and it really didn't matter what he was using. And he, We went out for a dive in the morning and um, swam to a spot. At that point I knew where the bait was. I was tracking the bait every sort of day or so. And swam to the bait and within, I shot a yakka. I said, don't you shoot, just wait for a kingy. And I did not expect it, but he just dived straight down as soon as I shot the yakka and I went to shake it a little bit. And he just dived down and shot a probably an 18 kilo. And it went straight into a hole at about 18, 20 metres. And it's like, fuck, it's got my gun, it's got my gun. And, you know, this sort of stuff. And I'm trying to go down and have a look. And it went into a hole and went horizontal about maybe five metres. I could see the handle hanging out of the <laughs> At about 18 meters, because he's the handle out of the hole, you know. So he's yelling at me for his gun, and I'm like, mate, I just need to breathe up, shut up, just <laughs> leave me. I stuck my ears underwater and lay on my back for a second, and rolled down. And luckily, I pulled his, you know, handle out, and next thing the, the line came out, and next thing the shaft came out, and the fish was still on it. And beautiful. I got up. You walk past 200 people trying to get back home in Bondi, unfortunately. And he, he, he was telling everyone, I put the shaft, I put the fish on his shaft. This guy's magic. Who is this guy? <laughs> I didn't do anything. He just put it on my shaft and my spear. Oh, my hero. It was all it was all him, mate. It was all him. And he still uses the old free diver gun. Yeah, um, yeah. You can't go wrong with them. They're, they're a great, they're uh, a great platform. Tool, a tool's a tool. A good tool's a good tool, isn't it? Yeah, it just lasts you forever. Mate, awesome. That's cool. I like the fact that one of your most special kingies was uh, was actually someone else that you were taking out. And um, that speaks volumes of kind of where you're at in your spearfishing journey, I think. Bob McComb's kind of famous for that that uh, steps of a maturity, you know, like uh, in terms of a Spiro, like, the, you know, where, where you get. I think when you start to find as much joy in helping other people achieve their goals, it, it's 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 a cool p- place to be in, I reckon. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Grateful to be there. I wish I was younger, though. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, let's go to some records. So Malachi Green, who's uh, actually all the records in Australia are held by Welshmen, which might disappoint a few. Uh, Malachi Green's got a 32-kilo um, fish he, he shot out of Swansea. Um, a Middleton, I'm not sh- sure who that is, she's got the woman's Australian record at 26 kilo and at a Currawong. Yep. Linda Middleton. Who's that? Oh, no, that's 90s it'd be, yeah. Uh, 2000 on the dot. Oh, 2000, yeah. And she's a lovely, lovely lady, lovely woman. The open record, though, is way back in 1985 at a Little Seal Rock, um, S. Brabant. Steve Brabant. Okay, there you go. So mm. some old records there, but like um, like the the junior record was only taken in 2019, so these fish are still getting around. So Yeah, yeah. Well, a funny story there, Shrek. Sorry to interrupt you there, Si, but we um, – we had young Eddie Sherb from the Dolphins and at Adreno. He started at Adreno when he was, I think, 14 years of age. And um, in a comp, he took uh, the junior record, Kingfish, at the time. And this was a few years back. And held the record for a number of years. And then we had another top little diver, Grayson, an amazing waterman, sort of ex-junior world surfing champ and top Spiro from around Bondi. And he ended up um, taking Eddie's record. And their best mates went to school. And, and there was a bit of shit between them. You know, I heard Eddie... And and Grayson sort of giving it to each other, and Grayson's like, "I just got took took, you, took your fucking record, mate." And <laughs> and then when Malachi, the following day, Malachi shot that big fish and took Grayson's record, and Eddie's <laughs> like, "Mate, you only you only took my record for a day, shut up." <laughs> <laughs> That's gold, eh? I remember that, Jesse. Yeah. Really cool. I'm remembering with a level of open hostility and resentment the time I walked out into my old house and my housemate was chopping up veggies with one of my filleting knives. Oh, 
Nowadays, though, good news is Noob Spiro has a knife roll. It's two banging victory knives in Eggington double-sided steel, a two-sided scaler and fishbone tweezers, and a custom heavy-duty canvas roll made right here in Australia. Check it out at noobspiro.com. Head up into the shop and get yourself a knife pack made by the Noob Spiro for other Spiro legends like you. Check it out at noobspiro.com. The Freediving Manual is a video manual that contains absolutely everything that I would teach on one of my freediving courses. Everything broken down video by video so you can effectively take a freediving course at home. The manual is perfect for any Spiro who wants to brush up on their freediving knowledge or get up to date with all the latest freediving safety and performance knowledge. Great news guys, Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code SPIRO, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one, there's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Kill shot spear guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Kill shot spear guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off. Any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Tell us, um, maybe Simon, we could come back to you. Um, so, like, we've talked about the excitement of finding the kingies, which is half the battle, isn't it? And then, you know, we find the kingies. Maybe we, we've gone looking for bait, like sort of Craig's alluded to. We find these yakka on a pressure point somewhere, and we kind of know, okay, this is, like, good ground for kingies. From there, what does it look like in terms of gear, body language and, you know, the right behaviour to approach these fish? Oh, well, I think I said before, like, you can land a kingy with any kind of gun. There's, uh, I'll go back to Vince Isagba last year that donated the 22 kilo kingfish he shot off Bondi. He jumped in to shoot a brim for dinner, so he took an easy little 90 with no rig cord, yeah? He thought it'd be five minutes, saw a silver trevally dive down, said that'll do, and then this big kingy swims in front of him. Whack! All right, and he's tied around the ocean. Great story. He's got it, 90 centimetre. So with anything, with no know, rig line and no yeah. float. That's crazy. You know, literally jumped in to get a fish for tea. So it's, it's great. So there's always a story like that. But you will maximise your chances with having enough, enough gun. So <laughs> normally, like at Adreno, we all say, if, if you're serious, like use a 1.1. Mm. Um Rob Allen do a Sparadivo that's, you know, a twin 14 mil with a little 7 mil shaft that goes well and you could use a metre and get away with shooting, you know, medium-sized kingies of that. that. Um, and, again, it's how close you get in the shot placement. Rife Euros are very, very popular in the 1100 and 1200 range. Blokes like the twin 16 mils with that, with the 7.5 mil shaft, they well, there's a lot of passionate Rife Euro fans. Um, and some of our guys uh, who who we know and, and love that come into the shop and shoot great kings use the rife euros. Um, they're, they're fans. Craig mentioned that before. Me, mate, I, I use a, a bob gun um, predominantly. One point, I think it's just shy of 1.3, 7.5 mil, twin 14 mil rubbers, really sloppy because I'm old and feeble now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been using that setup for 30 years. I love it. Just, How old are you, Simon? I've forgotten. Yeah. Old enough to know better than to tell you my age. <laughs> <laughs> still Mate, young still, enough to get away you've with it. Noob, noob, noob Spiro dating service or something. You've still time. got a bit of a rep though, Simon. Like uh, you're a bit of a uh, weapon in the water, I hear. Oh, uh, uh, mate, it's just they're, they're all rumours. They're people who uh, 
probably have never died with anyone better, mate, maybe, eh? There's always someone better. I mean, comparison is <laughs> yes, a thief man. of joy. But you mate, gotta... just think, if you come down to Sydney, we'll come out with some of the guys, man. Oh, I really want we'll to. Blow your mind. There's some I, great guys. I've been running spearfishing courses up here too, and, like, to be honest, like, you've been someone I've looked up to for a number of years. I actually wanted to come down and just sort of be a fly on the wall and watch you teach some new guys how to spear because there's so much from learning and watching other people teach. Like, like there's going spearfishing yourself, which is great, but then there's t- learning to teach others and help them overcome hurdles. And, um, like, I, like, it'd be cool to watch you, watch what you do what you do. Yeah, mate, come, mate, you're more than welcome to come down, mate. Just We can talk about that after. Just Yeah, 100%. Let me have a look. Man, I'm always just big on – Yeah, we've had this. I'm not big on breath hold and big on depth and everything. I'm just big on relaxing and enjoying, I'm the same. enjoying the session. And just I like the fine-tuning. I like where's your head, where's your fin, how you're finning. That's important to me. Yeah. Now I'm a big thing on finning at the moment. Um, this, uh, I've just noticed huge improvement if people are fitting right, um, like along the surface and going down and back up and their recovery. Um, and I'm just big on not having a big lung full of air, man. It's mm. just you don't need it in mm. Sydney anyway, right? So, mm. and that just makes people more comfortable. Anyway, so it's just, and I enjoy doing that, fine tuning up guys or going out with blokes and saying, hey, have you tried this or have you tried that and whatever else. Like right. Sahil, that um, does a bit of work at Adreno, he got his first kingy with me and he did a course with me and then he joined the club. Um, and then he came out with me again. I said, mate, dive this spot six times, you'll shoot a kingfish. <laughs> now, I didn't know, but he came out with me one time. We're in the water. We had the plan. We were with another diver, Chenk Alpa, I think. It, yeah, it was Chenk. Chenk, he's a gun. He uses these beautiful um, inverted rollers that are made in Turkey. They're sensational weapons. Um, Any brand? What, what oh, it? man, I can't think of the brand. If you brand. remember it later on, tell me. Yeah, man, it's beautiful. They're works of art. They're like as good as an Alemani to look at. They're sexy. Yeah, wow. Um, and after about 25 minutes, I'm getting worried because I hadn't seen Sahil and he's new. I'm going, where'd he go? I saw him when we got in in the first 100 metres. And I said, we're going to swim straight up to this bommy. Then we're going to go to the shark cave. Then we're going to go out to the anchor rope that's, that's suspended in the water. There was an anchor rope there that always had rat kings and bait around it. Yeah, yeah, we've got something similar off Brizzy. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's normally I always make sure that there's an anchor rope that's there suspended. Um, and then Chenk goes, oh, he got a kingy. And as soon as he got the kingy, he just caught a wave and got on the rocks, got toweled up, and he's probably home now already. I said, what? By the time I got back, he's got beers. He's coming from here to here. He's taken it home, put it on ice, grabbed beers, came back, and, mate, he was celebrating. I was oh, just <laughs> And it was 10. 10 That's kilos fantastic. or something like that. He's a really good first fish. Yeah, yeah, and cool. he said, guess what? That was the sixth time I've oh, been Oh, that's there. perfect. That's yeah, cool. how good's that? That's so it was great. Cool. That's just, that's sick. That's what I love. Yeah. I love that too. Like, and, and one fish can make your day. And I, I guess with a kingy too, it's such a substantial animal, you know, like a small kingy is like five, six kilo legal. Um, let's talk briefly about legal sizes in New South Wales. Um, can you walk me through – Bag limit and size limit, if you can. Um, feel free to chime in on this, Craig, too. Yeah, man. Well, um, bag limit's five and That's... size limit's 65. Okay. So here, um, and that's tail length, not fork length. Ah, okay. Cool. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that big a kingy. In the um, competitions, the events that we run, like the, the Sydney competitions and I think along New South Wales, so I think it's three kilos minimum weight, which is still bigger than 65. So, um, oh, might be three and a half kilos now. Yeah. So um, it's, yeah, it's a small, look, it's not a small fish. It's a great fish. If I see one and it's legal, I'll, I'll, I'll whack it because they're great eating. Yeah, 100%. So they're, they're beautiful. Mm. There's that. Let's talk about eating. Um, Craig, you like Yo. eating kingy, is it? I do. I've um, I will generally get a kingy for my mother-in-law, um, and this is oh, that's a recommendation, mate. Mate, I've I've hung up a fish, and she she's um Japanese and a great ah yeah yeah chef. So I've hung a fish, gone back to get a camera to get a photo of it, or get a son out to come and take a photo of me with my fish in the background, and and he's like, Dad, 
the whole side of that fish is gone already. If my mother-in-law sees me with a fish, she's, she knows it's her, so she'll just come and grab it. You know? Oh, um, wow. I've always let her cut up, cut it up. She's got old Japanese knives that have been passed down to her through the family. And, yeah, it's kind of a process for us. And then she'll put the sashimi on the table, elderly now, and she'll sort of look at it. And I can tell that she's remembering moments from her earlier years. And she'll often go, oh, I remember doing this with my father and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really cool. But um, my, I, I'm sort of just grab it if I need one. Um, I'm lucky I'm five minutes down the beach. And if I need one, I'll, on average for me, it's about, well, I can't just grab one if I need one. It's about probably 15 hours in the water. I, I think people like maybe Justin Ewan and some of those guys have mentioned about 12 hours of box me in the water to come across a, a decent king. Um, right. There's a couple of local spots you can just jump in where Simon sort of dives. It. You can see kings quite frequently, but waiting for something nice and sizable for to come in. I'm a bit lazy with my preparation. So if I'm going to prepare, I've got a big family. I've got three boys. Yeah. I've got four. And they're all, they're all family, into it as so. well. Mine's the same. How do, how do you do your kingy to feed the kids? What are they like? Sashimi as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they like we, wasabi? Um, do they like the works or are they like just your soy soy boys? Um, I'm part Chinese, so we'll always do a bit of a soy and wasabi. I'll have a Chinese soy. My wife and the rest of the kids will always go with the Japanese, yeah. yeah right. But my kids, it's funny, I tried to get them into diving earlier and I think the oldest one, um, you know, he took the diving on board and he can spear. Um, he's got it under his belt, but it's not his thing. Yeah. Um, he has other interests, you know, different age in between that 20 and 30 age group. And then my youngest, I said I had three boys, I actually have two boys and a girl. Youngest boy is 17 and he was born a vegetarian. So oh. if I bring a fish home, and he's taught me a little bit about selective approach to taking animals and mm. I come home with a fish or you know, a pile of drummer, he's probably not going to be happy with it. So um, I'll come home with a fish occasionally and I'll say to my wife, where's Jai? And she'll go, he's playing the computer game, go around the back. And so it's like, I look for a bigger fish just so I can go around the back and prepare it and it lasts a little bit longer. But um, my daughter, so I've got an adopted daughter, my niece. Um, she lost her mum when she was young and lost her dad quite suddenly and didn't dive much. I'd always, she lives upstairs. I always say, come for a dive, come for a dive. And she wouldn't, never came, you know, snorkel with her friends and go diving with her girlfriends, but not with me. Um, and not free dive or spear, just sort of snorkel and with a couple of little breath holes and, when she lost her dad, I took her out. We were busy with stuff, obviously, with funeral arrangements and all this horrible scenario for about a week. And I said to her, do you want to come for a dive? I need to get out of the house. And she's like, yes. At the time, I had a pair of carbon fins, and she fit my size carbon fins, you know, long freediving fins. I popped a suit on. She's my size. I popped on a small men's suit and squeezed it on her. Next thing, she hit the water at Bondi, and she couldn't feel the water touch her body, so she could relax properly and get a breath hold. And had long fins to make it more efficient in the water. And as soon as you got out, she's like, all I want to do is fucking kill a kingfish. All I want to do is get a crayfish. All I want to do is fucking get a crayfish. You know, when, when am I going diving? When can I go with Simon Trip? When can I go with Simon Trip? <laughs> <laughs> so well, Simon's taken her out. We've done a few few dives already. Oh, but um, yes, it's it was one of the really cool things. I didn't mention the correlation with Simon and when I was taking kids out earlier. Um it's not sustainable to take kids out without a or train people without a proper process and, yeah. and some dive buddies and colleagues. And Simon had the capacity when he joined the business to for us, and even prior to that, for me to be able to go, Simon, we've got people coming in wanting to dive in the juniors. Um, I've got a father and son that want to do it. And it was amazing when we could just pass the contact details over to the, to the dad and the kid, and you know they're headed in the right direction. You know, when, what I mean by that is, yeah, they'll get introduced to the water. They, Simon's modest what he i've watched what he does he he teaches people how to be a seaman or an old yeah. sea dog so he talks about things where you're entering where you're exiting you know the scenarios that can happen in the water which might change where we're going to exit and a second backup exit and then he'll take people out to get to know the gun and then he watches them move in the water and focus on equalization posture and dropping and you just focus on them as an individual and what i really like about it is it's you know one-on-one one almost it's actually quite incredible to have you know, one of the only accredited spear fishing instructors in the country out of Adreno in Sydney, which is, yeah, really cool. So th thank you, Simon, mate. Yeah, yeah. Mate, that's, a, that's a great endorsement. Amazing. Craig, you yeah, you're an amazing human being and 
Yeah, well, and what I saw as a diver Simon. coming from PNG is Simon's not just, you know, it's not just Simon. His father, Rick Tripp, is a legend as well in our parts. Rick's yeah. still nailing big gum. I don't know how and why he does it amongst the crocodiles up in Darwin, but he's yeah. still nailing, nailing big jewfish and stuff yeah. around the wrecks in Darwin, yeah. Simon was our first guest on the podcast, Craig, for reasons was like he? the ones you've just yeah. laid out. Because his 100%. reputation precedes him, and he's always a pleasure to have on the podcast, and he's always oh, welcome. Man, cut this out now, guys. No, Craig. no, no, Simon. This is what you he's deserve, buddy. <laughs> this is what you deserve. And you, 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 um, you do so well to inver- avoid controversy and politics, and uh, and I think the whole community loves you. You've done a magic service to the east coast of Australia with safety workshops, taking people out on your own dime often. Um, and if you make some money out of running courses now, which I hope you do, uh, you deserve every penny you get, buddy. Yeah, cheers. Man. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I don't like doing it. Yeah, I do too. I've really, like, you kind of inspired me. I mean, I've only been doing teaching courses for about a year now, like spearfishing courses, but I never really wanted to teach freediving. I'm a bit like you. Like, I, I like teaching freediving in the, within the context of spearfishing. So everything's about spearfishing. Um, and I, yeah, again, we'll, we'll, I'll pick your brain later, but, um, let's, let's get back into yellow if we can. Um, Simon, You've got this guy six dives on the same spot, and he's got his kingy. What did you advise him with regards to? Like we've talked about, sort of his spear gun. I'm taking you love a, a rig line and a float, just so because yeah, um, managing line with a big kingy too can be a bit of an issue. You you can get tangles, and I want to go there in a sec. But in terms of like we're getting down, what are we talking about? We see them maybe from the surface, or what are we sort of? A- uh, look, so. If we're talking, what I say to blokes is find the bait. You, you know the pressure point. I think everyone knows the pressure point now. If there's a bit of tide running, that's great. Just go to the side where the bait's going to be. Um, and don't, I don't necessarily dive on the bait. I dive off the bait. Um, I don't burly. Um, what I've been using a lot that I love using is just a piece of PVC pipe. Mm, throw white, like a throw pipe. I don't put anything else on it. A couple of boys do. I've seen some flash ones. Mm. They drill holes, put a little bit of rope, and they can throw them further. That's all great. But if you throw them too far, the current's go the wrong way, oh. man. <laughs> You're in trouble. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, man. But there's some great stuff. There's flash bombs that they use with the tinsel hanging off them as they drop them. It's, it's amazing what's out there. Spoons are a bit too quick and heavy for Sydney because it's shallow. Um, but just a, a piece of white PVC pipe, man, like eight inches long, 18 mil diameter. And just, you do know, you, and do you, you know, just when put that up be... the bottom of your wet, wetsuit or where do yeah, you store mate, it? Look, I, I just have it hanging off my rig cord. I just poke the rope through it, do a little granny knot like a loop, and just it's there. And when I need it, oh, I just yeah, right. open, it comes off and throw it. So it's just behind my flippers. Yeah. And sometimes I'll even just have it around behind me and I'm diving with it so I slide down my rig cord to my shark clip and then it'll slide back us up as I'm coming up. I often like having a couple of fish in my rig cord suspended in midwater yep. around areas that I know kingies are and kingies will quite often swim around those fish because they're suspended eight or nine metres down. Um, I was going to talk to about that too, like the old trick where you you might shoot a kingie and you're out with your buddy and he hasn't shot a, a kingie. Um, walk us through that scenario. Oh, mate, that, that's a given. That's um, a, a great thing to do for those that don't know. Um, if you see see kingies, um, Ivan did this last year. Yeah, last year, just before the season went to crap. Um, I knew there were kingies around. Oh, I couldn't get them to come in. But the, a, a few Benito came in and I dropped the pipe and the Benito came in on the the pipe, as did a Sergeant Baker, came rocketing off the bottom. And that's when you know it's a good day. But yeah. like the ground fish, like red rockies, and they're coming and rip it, try and get, get to the pipe. So you know every, it's dinner hungry, time. Hungry, hungry. And um, so I told the bloke, I said, look, this is when I saw, I said, this, I'm going to throw this pipe, dive on it. I'll probably shoot a fish, don't worry, but shoot the biggest fish that comes up to you. And he went, what, what, wait, what? And I said, just <laughs> do it. And I've thrown the pipe, waited. Drifted down on it, shot a bonito, picked up the pipe off the bottom, and the bonito ran for the surface, which is really cool. And it brought all the kingies came out, ah. and came up, and followed it up. Sick. 
And so he's still on the surface and hasn't fired his gun. And I said, mate, Mark, shoot a fish, shoot a fish. And he goes, which one? I said, the biggest one. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, yeah. And he missed that opportunity then um, just through nerves but got one later, which was great. The same scenario. did the same scenario about 45 minutes later and it did her. It worked. So it was great. I always tell people now the closest one because, like, but Kingies will come in, like, so close. Like, you, you, you do have time, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's um, happened on the weekend with a couple of the boys that are out looking for craze and dirty water. Um, and one of them dived down and he'd come out of a hole, turned around and looked and saw he got swarmed by big fish, big kings. And this is now, this is on the weekend. Mm. And so he's taking his time. They're a metre off his feet tip. And he said, you know what, I think I'll choose you. But then death from above, his mate, oh. dived down and shot and shot one and spooked him and he had a quick shot um, to no avail on a much bigger fish. And he was cursing himself. He should have just shot the first one closest, but he took his time to pick a big one out. Now the one that his mate got, it needed another shot into it. It was 24 kilo. So there were some there over 30 kilo and that's oh. Yeah, man. And this is at the start of the season, mate. The season hasn't really kicked off yet, so there's some big fish around at the moment. Mm. That would be one of those dives where you come home and you're just stewing about it and you're ready to go back out and try again. And I, I, I think you'd be talking to that mate and you'd be having a word to him, I reckon. Because if I'm on Apparently the- there was a, there was a conversation the I next day. I bet you there was. Yeah, the next mm. day. He's uh, when he calmed uh, down a bit. Yeah, he's very good. He's very good. Yeah, I won't nice. mention names. They know who they are. The sweet, sweet sound of equalising on your way down a hunt of fish. It's not that sweet, though. In fact, most of the time we don't even notice those sounds until we review our GoPro footage. But sometimes, though, a sticky eustachian tube an uncomfortable forced EQ or ears that just won't clear can derail your dive day. Sounds like you might need Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Friends of Course, available at noobspero.com forward slash Ted. Equalize instantly and effortlessly using Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Friends If you go through his EQ program and Ted doesn't teach you to Friends within 30 days, he will offer you a full refund. Make your EQ problems a thing of the past. Learn more at noobsparrow.com forward slash Ted and use the code noobsparrow to save some moolah. Ocean Guardian and Noob Sparrow have partnered up to bring you a 10% discount on the Freedom 7 or Scuba 7. These are shark deterrent devices brought to you by powerful shark shield technology, the world's most effective electrical shark deterrent, scientifically proven and tested, backed by governments, research, and multiple independent bodies. This, this is some of the best tech on the market. They continue to innovate and inspire. They've been doing this for more than 20 years. Check it out, noobspero.com forward slash OG. That's noobspero.com forward slash OG. When you get to Ocean Guardian, check out the Freedom 7 or Scuba 7. If you want to purchase, use the code noobspero to save yourself 10% on your Shark Shield device. The Freedom 7, 10% off. Go to noobspero.com forward slash OG. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros. 
and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Mate, Sydney's a special place too. Like you guys have got some awesome sort of conditions there at t- at times. Like it's variable, like a lot of the east coast of Australia. But you guys have got some pretty special ground, and in such a heavily populated area, you guys have arguably got a really um, cool fishery going. Like, um, you know, obviously we've seen the uh, the eastern rock lobster, the bag limit increase due to good fisheries management process. We've we've seen some some success in our in our in our in our world due to like good management over years. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying seeing the fruits of the labor. What do you think about the Kingfish um, fishery anecdotally? What's your opinion on it? And Craig as well, feel free to join in here, buddy. The, the one thing I don't, Craig, do you want to say something first? I think um, I'd see the size limit maybe, which I think we're up around the 75 now, so I'm correct me if I'm wrong, we're at 75. 65. Size limit. 65, mate, it is minimum. A little, little bit longer probably wouldn't, I wouldn't mind to see and maybe less than five. I, I, you know, I, I do get you want to count, stick to our limits and, and take five, but I, I personally don't think I need to see five taken off for myself. I, we've got some shark presence now and, and um, in Sydney and there are more sharks around and I don't want to see someone maybe hanging out in the water for a long time getting that first kingfish or getting that kingfish that he was waiting for, for 12 to 15 hours to get and maybe – Greed overcomes you and you're hanging around for, to get that second one. And, you know, shark, the ocean can level things out for you very quickly, as we know, and might come in for your fish or it might come in for your leg next time, you know. I'm just looking at Simon. I think he's indicated two. I think two is a good bag limit for kingies. I'm Would you like to see that? Simon and I had the second one. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Craig, what are you talking about? Well, I think five yeah. is too many. I, I, I think if you, you do, come home yeah. with two two kingies, I think you've done well and you'd be pretty bloody happy. Like if you've shot two 10 kilo plus kingfish, that's so much meat to process and it's so, it is. so much to feed people. I, I don't think I mean, you I, I can't that. say that I'm right. I've sat in the water and shot four. Yeah. Um, I've been I, and I've been around blokes that have shot five or six, and I'm just like, mate, you might as well have a teeth, a, a knife between your teeth. You're a cold, cold-blooded cold killer. Uh, it, it, for me, it was like, oh, uh, if you're – I wanted to put another rule in place. When you get good at shooting kingies, and if you can get close enough to actually see a spot on the fish we're about to take a shot, you're probably going to put, put the shot into it. Um, that's what I found. And if you get close enough to them, you know, maybe don't freeze and put things in the esky or refrigerate and farm. I, I would like to maybe, and look, I'm lucky again, I'm close to the water. So, you know, one or two is enough. I think if I lived inland west and, you know, maybe I was that inland hunter and I wanted to get fish and to want to go to the supermarket to get it. Yeah. yeah maybe four or five is important. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And this is the, that's the reason why they have five, man, because they obviously think it's sustainable, right? So Exactly that's, right. That's one thing. And it comes down to choice. Yeah. We don't have to shoot five. Yeah. So yeah. that's right. I, and see, dog you, I hear you, man, too, where you're saying you've shot four. Like I grew up in the 80s spearing and I got my first kidneys in the early 80s, I think, as a young bloke. Still yeah. remember it. Swansea. Clean as, beautiful, great. Shot two, over the moon. Um, only small, um, four or five kilos, can't remember. But it's where I've also had days where I've speared heaps and good ones and walked up a cliff with them all um, <laughs> and just had no dramas whatsoever and I'd do it again the next day. And that was the culture and the time. Yeah. But then um, the kingfish traps came out, those five yeah. kingfish traps. Mate, they disappeared very quickly. It was incredible. I've read, um, I've read about it this. Like this lean period, but we knew that late October we'd see big ones or you'd have an opportunity. Um, but before you hear guys from the uh, who speared in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s tell you that on the central coast they go down and shoot a dewey off the two or three mile. And, you know, I can remember Dave Ainsley, uh, not Dave Ainsley, um, Oh, sorry, wrong Spiro from the Central Coast. He boated for me in the Blue Water one year. Lovely bloke, mate of Jeff Hustles and Rick Verace. Forgotten he's a snake charmer, he's a snake man. He, um, the pathologist, he told me he went to shoot a big Jewy once and he shot a kingy because there were so many kingies that just got in the way. <laughs> they're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, I didn't see that period. I was too young. Um, but 
so they were there. Um, you know, kingies were 99 cents a kilo in 1982, I can remember, and Jewfish were five. <laughs> so, yeah. so they were thick. Yeah. But then I saw them decline, um, so I appreciate them. So there's no way personally I take my bag on it these days because I, I value them. I naturalists have a bit of an article about the Sydney situation. They said in in the nineteen seventies that was where they introduced these kingfish traps, and it and it does sound like by the mid nineties they were they were kind of like largely gone from the Greater Sydney area, or or, or reduced to a point where you, you weren't seeing them very often. Is that kind of your experience, Simon? Like I know you you know the seventies was a bit it's early just- for you. Mate, I, I was too young, but I know in the eighties I saw I would saw them, um, and then I know they they went quiet. And then hearing the anecdotes of all the guys around me who were older than me and the tribe talk, yeah, and like you look at the line fishing. I used to collect an avid line fisherman as well, and got fishing news every week that Dick Lewis used to put out this awesome fishing publication in New South Wales. It was a newspaper. Um, Man, no, they'd catch huge kingies off the peak, you know, 10, what is it, 10, 12 miles off Maroubra Sea Dog. Um, mm. Line fishing. It was game fishing. The kingies mm. I don't think that yep. happens much these days. Um, so they were thick. They were, they were thick. Do you think they're yeah. coming back? Do you think they are increasing? It's a, it's a, it's a good signs. Are we seeing signs of a recovery? Obviously, they're there in numbers at certain times of the year. <laughs> so it's a it's a contentious I, issue. I personally think they are. You ask me anecdotally, I think they are. I'm seeing the, the amount of bigger fish, and people say, "Oh, social media now, man." Social media has been around for 15, 18 years. Mm. Like you know, I, we're seeing. I think I'm seeing bigger kingies being put up on photos and everything, and and guys in my club are shooting great ones every year, and then. Talking to a to a uh, a sly fox today that stopped publishing photos. Love you, Juzzy. Um, he's spearing great fish. He's just not putting it out on social media as much anymore. A, a lot of the guys aren't have stopped doing social media stuff. It's yeah, not, man. Yeah. It, it, and and I I think it might might be a good thing. I think I spoke about this in the first interview I had with you, man. Where yeah. it was going to go. Yeah. <laughs> I think we predicted it. Yeah. Some of the things you told me way back in the. Like it's ten years ago, I think, when we had our interview. Was it? Some of wow. those things have sat with me remarkably well, and your foresight with regards to social media, I think, was was apt. Like, um, it it, you know, and and it, you know, the Noob Spirit Instagram. Like, I think we've got eighteen or nineteen thousand followers now, and oh, you awesome. know, we, we follow a whole bunch of those people, and but sometimes the feed is just so many dead fish, and it, I, I think. Social media can kind of distort people's perception, particularly the mainstream public's perception of what what it is that we do. And it's an unfortunate sort of side effect of it all. And um, I'm not surprised that a lot of experienced spearers no longer engage with that, you know, celebrating their catches on social media. Yeah. Mate, the good guys make it look easy and it's not easy. Mm, Yeah. 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 And to the uneducated public who we have to convince that we're selective, sustainable, safe, ethical, et cetera, et cetera, it's a hard sell. Mm. And they're like, oh, look at that wahoo. Look at that marlin. It just swam right up to you. Look at this. Look at that. I said, man, that guy's probably put in 500 hours. Oh, easy, easy. Spent 10 grand in fuel, like yeah. the carbon footprint. Like, come on, let's go. <laughs> no. To get that fish and it's – all gone. It's eaten by the tribe, or he's found. You know, like it, nothing gets wasted, and they breed like rats. This is marlin. Mm. Okay, that's not a that's not a biggie to me at all. But yeah, it's, it's just it just looks easy, um, and it's not. It's a skilled person who's filmed it and is spearing it when they show that. You've got to give credit to the skills the skill level there. So back to body language hunting. Um, we, no, no, no. It's all right. We get we get we get diverted, and I, I just want to bring us back to some of it because I, I think it's important, particularly for people that maybe have never shot a, a, a kingy for the first time. So you know, we're on the surface. Maybe we see a school approach. Um, what are some some things, some do's and do nots with 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 kingies? You reckon? And and again, chime in where you like, um, Craig. See, I'll go for it. You know, it's the usual behaviours. The fish are going to figure in their lateral lines, whether it's a fish or a shark. So it's 
I'm fairly careful when I'm hunting kingfish with about my finning and then I'm not breaking the surface too much. Guns down by my side, so my shoulders are relaxed, it's not out in front. Um, and if I see kings or a fish or a single, my eyes are immediately diverted away from the fish. I take my eyes off the fish and do a drop if I'm at the top, again showing them my back and try and get on to almost level with them, not necessarily diagonal, uh, uh, horizontal, but maybe on a 45, get close enough to them and then I'll pull the gun out in front and take a shot. In Bondi, where I am, we've got a lot of good divers that are hammering a lot of kings. So I tend not to see a lot of schools. It's generally, for some reason, I see singles. But you see some good singles. And I think one of the great things about Sydney is we don't get, you know, you take a fish and they're not mushy generally, which is what you can find up north where there's flesh is. As soon as you cook it, it sort of comes apart. But um, I don't take flashes. I don't sort of drag a flash around. I don't use... um, any crack pipes or PVC pipes. Yeah, no crack for crack. If I can find the bait or sit in a spot out out deep and yep, and just um, take some drops. I see one, like I said, I just turn on an angle or work, move away from the fish. Generally, I'm with a young fella or someone who's less experienced, so I'm very conscious of where they are in the water. Um, so there's pretty firm rules we have to talk about. If we see a fish, it will either be their fish or mine. But um, uh, if it is my fish and I'm down there and, you know, so I mentioned uh, uh, a scenario there where you've got a diver above you and he sees the kings come in. What should they do? You know, um, they shouldn't die. I, I don't want to see them coming down with with me to the water. It's going to spook everything. Yeah. Um, and vice versa. When I've been on top and I've seen the fish down there, and you've got a diver down there, where you can help again is moving away from the fish. So turn your back, pick very slowly away. And there may be a chance because your body is the rock line. And um, I've had to have many times down there and the fish come in a school and I'll just move out a bit deeper and flank them mm. so they can't go wide. And likely if the fish move in the direction away from the diver, they're going to see me go back to the diver again and they'll get the shot, you know. Perfect, Craig. We, we're having a couple of little issues there with your internet, Craig, but I, I think we got the gist of it. Um, Simon, I think Craig's laid out a couple of good scenarios there. Um, have you got anything to add to it? And I would yeah, love for you to go on. I'm, I'm a bit different. Um, I, the, you know how I mentioned about the newbies shooting good kingies? Mm. There's also a reason for that, man, because they make a lot of noise. Mm. They splash. <laughs> Their fitting actions are terrible a lot of the time. Feet out of the water, splash, splash, splash. Kingies hear that, you know, and mm. they go, what's that? What's that noise? You know, they'll, they'll come out of the white water, they'll come out of the shallows or they'll come up off the drop-off to investigate. Yeah. Because they're, they're curious, the big ones, they're curious, the little ones will check it out, right? Um, I, I, I don't mind noise, I don't mind splashing the water like you do for a wahoo, you know, or, or another pelagic out, out wide, um, out in the blue. I don't mind splashing the water. I also like being vertical. I like being upright in the water column and having my head out of the water for 30, 40 seconds when I'm on a, a pressure point. Because often the kings will come up and say, well, what's this? Yeah, you know, right. I think they're curious. It doesn't work every time, but it's uncanny how many times that can happen. Mm. Um, just all little things you pick up, nuances. I also like in the shallows in Sydney, we get a lot of this sort of yellow purple weed. It's kind of like almost, I'm not going to say parsley, I'm not a herb expert, but just it's kind of like a, a, a little weed, a purple weed, and you get that in stretches and I've I like that area because I think kings like to rub along it. Like they'll get in schools and swim and swarm and they'll be sideways and rubbing their bellies and stuff on it. Yeah, right. There's a couple of patches in the eastern suburbs. I normally go and I'll zigzag across that those areas. Um, I like flat areas on the shore side of drop-offs. Um, that'll hold bait or, or schools of pike as well. I like to trick those spots out and then come and just wait on the drop-off or or dive just before the drop off and crawl across and make myself known, mm. um, and then come up and then do another dive. And sometimes that'll bring in curious fish. Yeah, otherwise right. wouldn't necessarily come to you. There's it, lots. Of, everyone's got their own little nuances, man. I think yeah. with King, yeah. Shot shot placement and line management, if we can, um, give us just some some quick tips on on uh, on on shot placement and then what to do when you. Hopefully you've made a good shot and put some herd on the fish, but let's just say you haven't. Um, I'd love for you to walk through uh, managing line. 
Um, I'll take a shot if I can slightly above. I don't mind shooting down on an angle. I like a diagonal shot, that textbook shot above the pectoral fin, hopefully get the spear to go out the other side of the gill plate or through the pectoral. Um, if I'm close, I, I like that shot. I like just above the eye, run along just to anywhere near towards the end of the pectoral and down to that sort of pectoral joint in the throat, anywhere in there. Mm. Is, and if I can get a diagonal shot with, therefore my spear has gone through more meat, more hold, I like that shot. I like that shot a lot. Um, that That's my money shot. That's, I normally won't take a shot on a kingy unless I can get that shot. I've taken a few shots further back in the body and similar like angle shot, often angling down, going through the fish and then coming up. But like, you know, six or eight inches back from the gill rakers or even more. And it does not slow them down or hurt them at all. And they just give you some absolute curry. Like a, a 10 kilo kingfish will tow you down the water column with a like a breeze. And I'm, I'm a pretty strong swimmer and that they'll give me absolute curry and it takes five minutes to subdue them. Um, have you had any bad experiences with them? Yeah, I have. Um I have. It, it's just, but normally it was through being um, rushed, mm. careless, and just in areas where, where the reef's been difficult. But then I got taught um, in those situations where there's a lot of, where there's shallow area and, and, and hard rock where they can get in on the bottom. I got taught from a young age, never let them get to the bottom because mm. we were using prangers back then, man. So that's why the shot was important for us. And a shot just behind the eye, like on top of the eye, just behind it a few centimetres, normally knocks them out, mm. especially with a pranger. Um, point it does too, it rolls them. But I, two was to never let them hit the bottom. And then I worked out that if you get them from, if there's a drop-off near you, swim off the drop-off. And when they're in the deeper water, they can't get to the bottom, they give up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they give up. Like feeding them, they just curl their toes up and go bugger it. Once so, they give up, though, but then as soon as you, they come near you again or you get a hand near them, that's where they seem to get a second life. And on the spear, it's like they get an electric shock, mm. right? That's what mm. you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you get ready there, man. you got your knife in your hand, and like I like a bungee on my handle, so I've already got the knife ready. I'm not reaching for it while I'm trying to grapple the fish. The knife's just dangling off my wrist with the bungee. Right, and I'm getting set. I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to get this? It's make sure it's tied, it's not still green. And mate, I'll turn it up, I'll make sure it's upside down if it's a bigger fish. And I'll get it upside down, I clamp my knees around it, hand up the gills, and then whack over the goose, you know, with the knife on the side of the head. That's if I need it by then. Yeah. Mm. Um, but often it's just bang. Um, it's normally I deal with it in the hands. And you just if the fish one thing I learned too with fish, and a guy called Greg Smith told me this, and it's a very, very good tip, that if you've, you're worried about the fish, the spear and the fish, and the fish like a kingy and a mackerel is a classic with it, and it's fighting, fighting, and, and you're going to, and you know, I'm going to get the spear, don't grab the spear because your first instinct is to pull, mm. and the fish is going the other way. You'll pull off. So as you're grabbing the spear, whack it with the palm of the hand, the end of the spear, and push the spear through the fish further. Oh, yeah, right. And that's a great tip, man, and I've done that quite a bit, and it, it works. Make if sure you, the flopper's engaged you, when you pull it yeah, back. Yeah, you know, you see that flopper coming out of the skin on, you know, sticking out, and you think, oh, God, it's going to tear. What's going to happen when I go? It's going to go berserk, tire out a bit more. Oh, there's Mr. Whaler coming in. Oh, I need to deal with this quickly. Yep. Just And just pushing that, whacking that spear yes. really helps. Okay. So, yeah. Line management. So you Line get- management. Oh, mate, it's just the trick is to always keep moving forward and just keep peeling that record out behind you. Kingies, if they're, well, any king really, but they'll, they'll, they'll do um, so- whirlies, won't they? You know, like what do you call it? Merry go round. They'll go round and round and round. And if you're not careful, you'll get cracked up. And that's why I recommend never have a knife on your legs. <laughs> um, yeah. Because yeah, I'm the same. Or, or your spear line or your real line is going to get caught with that key spinning round and round. Mm. It happened to Rick, my dad, when he was younger at Bass Point, and someone had to cut his rig cord, man, and free him. Jesus. So he, was, he shot a really big key um, and it was towing him down. Um, and he got his legs wrapped around because it was spinning, spinning, spinning. And another spear happened to come along and cut the rope. 
So just to rehash that, so we've got the kingy, we've got like tension on the on the on the rig cord. We're on the surface. We're going to swim forwards, and we're going to play the line out behind us, making sure that it's not wrapping around any parts yeah. of our body. And I always have open hands and fingertips, just feeding it through. Yeah, I'm not wrapping the hand, the line around my hand or anything like that, and pulling and yanking. Mm. It's just holding it, and I've just got it the line in between, you know, thumb and four fingers, the first two fingers. Just pulling like that, letting it slip through, slip through. Yep. You know, feeding it out, playing it like a hand line. When need be, I start swimming forward again. Always being in, and when I'm stationary, just making sure I'm feeding the line away from me. Yep. And I'm swimming in the opposite direction, like turning in the opposite direction to where I'm feeding that line out. Cool. Love it. Very conscious of it. Yeah, that, that front line, the line in front of you, which includes your your shaft line and possibly some of your rig rope needs to be taught or keep taught all the time. So if yeah. you're swimming in front, yeah. you obviously need to keep it tight. But you want to be moving in the water so the line behind you is not, you know, turning into a bird's nest behind your fins and your legs. Okay, That's cool. That's a good, good technique to do. So constant tension on the line. So we've got pressure on it, positive pressure. So we're not letting it um, take too much. We're or, or, or sorry, we're not letting slack into that sort of between us and the fish. But then you also you also don't want to reef too hard because you you can pull the shaft back through the fish. Absolutely, if it's not a great shot, there's strong fish though. If it's a gut shot or anything below the lateral, yeah, it can tear off pretty easily. Yeah, yeah. and just keeping away from that line behind you is the important one. So if it runs, it's not going to get caught up behind you. If you're confident with the shot, you can be yeah strong with it, solid with it. Just don't let it get on the bottom. Mm. Um, there's like I've been at Adrena for a year. I've seen quite a few people coming in <laughs> with a gun of no spear and broken line or some great bent spears. I've got a collection of them out the back. Um, I tell think- every spearfishing shop that I ever talk to, you need to have a wall of bent spears and give your customers <laughs> a five dollar like rebate on their next shaft purchase, and because how cool is it when you see a wall of bent spears? There is a story behind every single one of them, and like even like experienced spearos will look at that and get an absolute chuckle out of it. Weld them, weld them together. We'll do it. Hey, so we'll, we oh, should do that. I'd love like to it. see it. Yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's that's pretty cool. We've got a few out the back there. A few. Few shafts, Craig. I've collected. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd I'd love to see good it. Good stories, man. You're oh, right. Oh, yeah, like you know that there's a story behind every one of them. Like, um, and and I think like when you see a hundred of them, you'd just be like, you know, these are my people. You know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because we've all experienced it, and it's like, yeah. it's just part of the ride. Got a sweet deal for you today, guys. Go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines. The Freediving Manual is a digital freediving course, one that you can do at home, at your leisure, whenever you've got time. The course contains absolutely everything that a freediving instructor would teach on a freediving course. The digital courses are broken down into a video format and they contain everything that a freediving instructor would teach on a freediving course. We have beginner freediving courses, intermediate freediving courses and advanced freediving courses for those who are working on diving deeper. The freediving manual contains all the safety information that any Spiro could want. Thanks Adam and team, love it. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Ocean Guardian is the world's leading shark deterrent technology, and the great news is they're now partners with the Noob Spiro podcast. You can save 10% on the Freedom 7 or Scuba 7 when you shop at Ocean Guardian. Uh, use the code NoobSpiro at checkout to save 10%. If you want to go there, easy, super easy, go to noobspiro.com forward slash OG, short for Ocean Guardian, pretty original, eh? Pump in the code NoobSpiro and you'll save 10% on your Shark Shield device. Get into it, get amongst it. Ocean Guardian are doing awesome things for Spiros. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Kill Shot Spear Guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American-made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns 
at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Fellas, um, we're going to head on out of here in just a sec. I'm going to get some critical dates from you. I want to know where people can find out more about the Kingfish Cup in Sydney. I've had an absolute blast chatting with you. I wanted to ask you one more sort of controversial type question before we um, before we get some critical dates and information from you. Um, in Sydney, there is a bit of a reputation that you guys do not like second shots on your fish. <laughs> Tell me about this. Oh, that's Simon Tripp that doesn't like second shots on it. <laughs> doesn't he? Okay. I'll have to remember that when I dive with this. Right? Tell oh, me I'm, about that. I'm a big one. If I'm you haven't done it to me yet, Craig, otherwise you'd know about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I, it's a funny one with me. When I dived with Simon last time, I sat on a 45-degree angle behind him and watched him the whole time, and, and I know he's trying to get fish. So I, I was looking for sharks, yeah. and I'm watching my dive buddy's back. So even if it's school, schooled up below him and he's taking a shot on a fish, I don't really feel like I need to go down and get that fish with that school. I'm going to be watching his back until he deals with it and the fish is in the boat. And um, I'm close to him the whole time, looking out for sharks, watching his back, you know, just super conscious about that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah. Second shots. Second shots. As soon as I shoot a fish, I say to my buddy, shoot it again, fucking yeah. shoot it again. I hold up two fingers. I want to get the fish. I want to get the fish. I want to get it out of the water. I want to get it home. I want it not to flutter too much. If I have any doubts, I'm I'm holding up two fingers to my buddies on the surface, and that means get down there because Shrek's dumped another shit shot. <laughs> nice. Yeah, just... I, I had a, one of the Dolphins juniors out just last Sunday, and the conditions weren't great. And um, my technique is he said, I really want to get a salmon, which is funny because he's just been going for buddies. And... Uh, my technique was with the young fellas, I'd shoot a salmon or something and try and overexcite them. Come over here, come over here, you got to shoot it again, it's getting away, it's getting away. And when they shot it again, I'd just disengage my shaft and swim off and go, it's your fish now, you have to deal with it, whether it was a king or whether it was a salmon, you know. But um, yeah, I'm big for shooting my fish. I want to land that fish, although in the Kingfish Cup, but we can't be doing that, Simon. Oh, no second shots on the King. No. Yeah, land the fish on your own merit in the Kingfish Cup, man. Yeah, you yeah get someone else's right. gun and shoot it. It's just like Shrek, I was up in Morton earlier this year. There were four of us, and there were second shots required. Yeah. But it was always the bloke that shot the, fir- the fish the first time and said, hand me the gun. So you'd throw him a gun from the boat and he'd finish it off. It's just, man, I don't know. It's just how we did it. It's how I got taught when I was a kid and it's just mm. – so did a few others in my era and it's just – Well, S- Sydney Spiros have arguably been yeah. doing this the longest and it's hey, kind of a – There's a lot of them. There's a lot of comp divers in Sydney, Isaac. I mean, there's 40,000 Spiros in, yeah. in, there's, in there's Sydney. There's plenty of blokes that are happy to second so, shoot. I'm happy for yeah. young blokes. I'm happy for blokes in my boat or crew to second shoot fish. I don't care anymore. It's just yeah. that people would – Back in the, those days when you first the first podcast, Shrek, that hold up the photo, you can see it's got six beer holes in it. And got, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Come on, you did not shoot that. Your five mates helped you. Yeah, you would yeah. not have landed that fish without their help. They should all be in the photo. I don't care if that's the case. Have them all in the photo. That's great. You got that's a good point. That's a strong yours. point. That's a strong right. point. I I think of spearfishing now as more of a team sport. Like yeah, if if I'm ever in doubt on a shot, I want to eat that fish and I don't care how many shafts go into yeah. it as long as it's going in the air ski. It's not, not going to the sharks, that's for sure. That's right. Yeah, 100%. Right. Agree totally. Yeah. Agree totally. Yeah, just I want I wanted to caught, not look what I caught. Okay, yeah, I'm not having to go here. I just <laughs> wanted to ask you, and I love heading out on a point of controversy, fellas. Um, your information night. You've given us a bit of a details about that, but can you just summarise it all again? Give me some okay. key dates on the, on the website. Adreno Sydney Kingfish Cup dot com dot au. Okay. Adreno Sydney Kingfish Cup dot com dot au. That's a mouthful, but that's how you'll find us. All the information's there. Um. Heaps of awesome photos, a little bit of video here and there, all the past winners, lots of what goes on, the details, how to enter, the registration, and on and on. It's a great website that Rico and Rico set up for us. Um, and otherwise, the dates are the 2nd of November at Adreno is the information night. We've got Evan Leeson, your old mate Evan Leeson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put me on to uh, Evan back in the day. He's a legend. We've got... The wonderful Josh Ward from Central Coast Sea Lions. Yeah, he's a legend too. 
he's a kingfish magnet, mate. He's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, and a bit of a crab magnet too, Josh. And he's president of the Sea Lions currently. Yeah. And um, I've also got Hardy Mensdorf, who's got a couple of thirds and a second in the Kingfish Cup, mate. Yeah. He's weighed in every year bar the atrocious year with they only held one day. Um, he's a legend, Hardy. He's been around for decades, top bloke. Um, and what he doesn't know about Kingies is in Sydney isn't worth knowing. He's a really good Spiro, really, really good Spiro. So it's an awesome panel. And then we've got the, the two guys from the Kingfish Project. Mm. And then we've got Chantel coming along too from DPI who does the Otolith program. Ah, wicked. We're going to talk about Otoliths and ageing as well. Cool. Um, so there's science, there's how to kill them as well, how to catch them. Well, you've got Jai Gibbons there too, so hopefully he'll do Jai some will be there. breakdown. Um, I'll be there. Actually, I've been thinking whether I, I should get Jai to come on board. There's a lot going on. I'd love him to be I'm sure he'll be there because he loves it as well. He froths. Yeah, he's a legend. So we'll, we'll see how we go. We'll all go out and try and get a king like for him to prepare for, for, the, for night, the dinner so. that night. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And uh, mm. what else? The Kingfish Cup itself is on the 11th and 12th of November. Okay. The following weekend. So there's a break. And then the presentation is the 16th of November. Okay. Again at Adreno. And that's awesome. We get over 100 people for that. I'm going to link up everything we've chatted about today at noobspiro.com forward slash kingfish. There's going to be a bunch of articles from my own kind of research and, and a bunch of facts about the kingy, as well as all of the Adreno Sydney Kingfish Cup uh, information night, the competition nights, the thank, the prize giving night, all of those things are going to be linked up there, as well as Simon's uh, details there, the Australian Spearfishing Academy, Craig is the uh, the manager of the Adreno Sydney stores, so they've got an awesome and vibrant community down there. Simon's waving his finger at me. He's got something important to say. One more thing. I've got it, mate. I've got to say thank you to someone too, Jason Harris, your buddy ah, Jason. Ah, Jace. He does the logos, mate. He's done me the sponsor banner. Obviously, Australian Underwater Products, mm. Penetrator Fins, Divar, Adreno, Manny Sub, uh, Rife, Cressy are involved. Um, oh, McCombs so, Beer Guns. The, the prizes. And who else? McComb. McCombs. Bob Spear Guns. Oh, man, I always forget about Bob. I get carried away. He's well, he's part player. of the family and he said it helps so, out. But up at the Bob McCombs donating the best prize, mate. It's the ladies' prize. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Very so nice. that's for the ladies. He does it every year. He's a, he's a legend, Bob. Bosha, so Diver, Gerber, Manny Sub, McComb, uh, uh, Ocean Hunter, Penetrator, Rife, Rob Very Allen, Salvamar, Spiro, Sunto. You guys have got a bunch of awesome sponsors on there. There's some fantastic prizes available. Again, guys, that's adrenosydneykingfishcup.com.au. If you just Google it, 15, it'll come up. 20 bucks to enter. Oh, 20 bucks. There you go. 15 bucks as a um, to register and 20 bucks to enter. 15 bucks to cover you for the US Bay membership for the weekend. Mm. We'll have a few weighing, weighing stations up and down the coastline, eh, Simon? Yeah, mate, normally cover. Are at Central Coast, at Terrible there, boat ramp, uh, Little Manly boat ramp in Sydney Harbour, Adreno, Sydney in Alexandria, and we've got a weighing station at um, Wollongong as well. Um, and also this year, mate, Fergo's Tackle Wall are getting involved. Oh, yeah. In the yeah. Waterway. We've got yeah. one of our um, um, Dive Spear and Sport. Dive Spear and Sport. Sergio's mm-hmm. getting involved there. And yep. I think I've got extreme spear fishing on the northern beaches. I think they're going to send a team. We're going to have teams between the four. Fantastic, shops. sick. And a mm. gold-plated Rob Allen spear gun is going to be the prize for the shop. Oh, yeah. So. A little mini ashes amongst the spear fishing <laughs> shops, and and um, just. Adreno will be putting a shit hot team together this year. I think that's awesome. If you guys are in the greater Sydney area or nearby, I would highly recommend you guys get involved in this. The Adreno Kingfish Cup. Um, check that out. And um, again, linked up today at noobspirit.com forward slash kingfish. Uh, Craig, Simon, absolute pleasure chatting with you, legends. Um, I've had an absolute blast, and I hope people have learned a bit more about the yellowtail kingfish, one of Australia's most iconic. Um, target species on the spear for sure. Cheers, Shrek. You're a legend. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Shrek. Thanks for your time, mate.
Right, guys, if you're in that greater Sydney area, I think uh, today's episode might have been right up your alley. If you're interested in hunting a king, I hope you took a bit out of this episode. Simon and Craig, both very experienced guys and uh, a wealth of knowledge. I thought I felt like uh, I felt like we give it a decent geek session. So, and it sounds like if you get along to any of those information nights, uh, there'll be even more there. And uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall down there for for this year's Adreno Kingfish Cup. So check that out. Again, if all those links mentioned will be at noobspiro.com forward slash kingfish. In just over a week, I've got another cool episode. It's Bert coming back, the old man blue. We talk about some of the game-changing spearing gear that he has had in the traps, uh, sort of innovating, iterating, and improving over a number of years. And uh, there's five bits of kit that, uh, that we discuss. And it's kind of good thinking around different parts of the equipment that we take with us and Bert's put a lot of thought into some of these items and it's a good old chat it's a little bit different we're geeking out on gear for a change this week it was geeking out on fish and in a week and a bit's time it's geeking out on some gear so hope you come back and join me for that Bert call to the old man blue uh he's a he's a good friend of mine so I hope you guys enjoy that um as usual legends thanks for leaving reviews for the podcast wherever you listen helps other people find the show but the best thing you could probably do is uh, tell your mates about it. It makes a huge difference. I see people um, tag the Noob Spearer on Instagram, on Facebook when they're telling their mates um, information about how to improve and get started and stuff like that. So massive thanks to you guys for telling your mates about it. All good. That's it for me for a little while. Come back in a week and a half. Bert Call to the Old Man Blue. Catch you guys. Dive safe. Are you looking for spearfishing gear in Australia? Head on down to your local Adreno Spearfishing Superstore today and explore their ginormous stores filled with mad gear and frothing staff. On top of a huge selection of high quality Australia price matched guaranteed spearing kit and high quality expert Spearo staff, Adreno offer afterpay and a super easy returns policy. Adreno will have you geared up for your next spearing sesh with a massive smile. That's Adreno Spearfishing with stores located in Perth, Aspley, Woolloongabba, Brisbane, the Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne. Get into it, head in today or shop online at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Online or even better, in store. Your new spear gear is waiting for you. Are you US based, looking for free diving, spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website is so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, These guys are absolute legends. And uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. Dot com. That's right, use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B 10 on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com.